Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our 95th day in hour. If you need assistance, please use the chat window. And if you're having difficulties in configuring your connection, please log off from the session and rejoin again. You may also use your phones or tablets to join by using the webinar ID 752-309-835. For those attending our webinar for the first time, please be advised that your microphones are all muted throughout the meeting. For comments, please use the chat box. And for questions, please use the questions box. The Q&A will be held after the lecture. Uh, tonight's speaker is Dr. Jack Bowie. He is the chair of the OHIE Terminology Services Community, and he is also an internationally recognized informaticist, regularly serving on healthcare and standards bodies, and is a frequent speaker on terminology issues at healthcare industry consortia and conferences. At present, Dr. Jack manages a number of corporate relationships, including those with the OpenHIE project and the HL7 Fire Initiative, and provides consulting and design support to Appleton products. He's also, uh, he also received his doctorate in electrical engineering and biomedical image processing from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. You may now call on Dr. Zach. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that was very kind. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, just a, a quick check, can everyone hear me okay and, and see my screen? Yes, we can hear you well. We can also see your screen, Dr. Zach. Thank you. All right, great. Um, so, uh, very happy to be able to speak to you all um, today. And, and what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the terminology services community uh, as part of the OpenHIE project. I know that all of you are, are familiar with OpenHIE. Um, Terminology Services has been a uh, central component of OpenHIE pretty much since the beginning. Uh, and what I'll try to do is just talk a little bit about a couple of issues there. Uh, first of all, what is the Terminology Services community? What do we do? Um, why do we feel Terminology Services are important? to the network, um, how we implement terminology services and some of the uh, applications that um, uses that we do have available. And then I'll briefly do a little bit about where terminology services are being used or, or perhaps more accurately, uh, what types of terminologies are being used in some of the OpenHIE implementations of which, we, uh, of which we're a part. Uh, again, if you do have any questions, uh, please feel free to pop them in the box and we'll, we'll try to get those answered as we go forward. I don't think we're, we're going to go through a whole 45 minutes here, so hopefully we'll have some opportunities for, uh, for discussion as we go. Uh, so this is uh, just a quick look at the terminology services architecture uh, that we've put together. And what we're talking about is the terminology services component which is there in the component layer. Now looking not so much at the individual component, but kind of taking a step back and looking at the, the terminology services community, um, we really manage currently two different types of activities. And I'll talk about each of these in a little bit more detail. Uh, a metadata clearinghouse uh, terminology and metadata standards. This is a a relatively new and, and still in progress aspect of our work, um, but it's really, I think, kind of interesting and, and will have broad applicability. Uh, the, the Clearinghouse is a centralized uh, resource uh, for access to international indicator sets and terminologies. So things that, that might be of use to the broad community as a whole, uh, and what we're looking to do is make those more easily available. Um, to all the communities. I'll give some examples, but it basically supports searching, downloading, and version management um, of these indicator sets and in the future of various standard starter terminologies uh, that might be available. Uh, what we're trying to do with the clearinghouse is make some of these terminological assets more easily available 
uh, to the broad community so that they can be integrated into your implementations. Then the other piece of the community is the definition uh, and provision for a reference terminology uh, for an actual terminology service. Uh, so this is a runtime component um, that is part of the OpenHIE architecture that serves up these static data sets uh, that we find to be useful in the HIE, things like code systems, um, value sets, and mappings. And then providing a set of public interfaces uh, for accessing these data sets. Um, and this can be used both by other open HIE components that we saw in the architecture, and actually, uh, in addition, other point of service applications, um, EMR applications, data collection applications, that may find access to these terminological sets uh, of value. We'll talk a little bit about why that would occur in a moment. So let's look at the metadata clearinghouse. As I said, this is a, a new activity. We've, we've been involved in this only for about the past three or four months on uh, looking to uh, provide access to some really public metadata that has been difficult or um, hard for the providers of this information to make available. So what we're, we're trying to do is uh, provide that central resource um, where organizations around the world can have access to uh, indicator definitions and or concept definitions for various terminologies. Uh, the Clearinghouse is certainly not a, a management tool uh, for the development of these terminologies, and it's not a runtime tool, uh, such as is provided by the uh, terminology services component, but it's really focused on publication and distribution. Um, making these data sets available, uh, more easily available to, uh, to a really a broad audience. The Clearinghouse is managed by um, OpenHIE uh, for the benefit of the overall community and all of the assets that uh, we will be presenting our public assets and available to anyone. I'll give an example of the web-based interface that, that we're exposing uh, that really allows browsing, searching, and downloading of these assets. Um, there's also a REST API for those that would rather have programmatic access. The initial implementation that we're working on right now uh, supports PEPFAR's datum indicators, and we'll take a look at that in a second. But we certainly expect that updates uh, will include other assets, uh, and in particular, some terminology starter sets, um, sets of terminologies or value sets uh, that would be more generally available to the community. Uh, so this is kind of a, a new idea for us, uh, and we're really looking for feedback as, as we get this up on to find out what would be of most helpful to the broad community to making these kinds of assets available. So here's a, here's a screenshot of the clearinghouse as it exists today. Uh, again, a central location where these definitions and metadata can be published uh, and then made available to various stakeholders. Um, the initial work is on the PEPFAR datum uh, activities. And so if you were to, to click on that uh, datum link uh, on the clearinghouse, uh, you'd come to this page, or obviously this is a, a subset of the page, um, where we talk a little bit about datum, about the aspects of datum. Uh, and then down at the bottom, um, there's actually a fairly long list of the individual assets that are available, um, code base code list, uh, facility code list, uh, medical store narratives, uh, host country results, etc. cetera. Uh, and those can be downloaded in the variety of formats that you see here. Uh, I would point out that, that if you look down here at the bottom of the screen, you can see that we have a, uh, a different version of the data set available. So one of the key aspects of the clearinghouse that we're working on is to be able to have historical versions available um, of these various assets. Uh, it isn't always appropriate or required uh, for an organization to use the most recent version. There's all kinds of governance issues that, that we'll talk about in a minute uh, that may be involved in that. So the availability of uh, historical data, uh, previous versions of these 
uh, assets can be uh, very important for the management of a, of a given information exchange. Uh, so I'm not going to talk any more about um, the metadata clearinghouse right now. This is, as I say, a quick snapshot of where we are today. I've um, got a lot of ideas and are really looking forward to uh, your comments on how that could be potentially of most value to you uh, and things that we could be adding to the clearinghouse after um, after we get this up and running. So look forward to any questions that you would have on this uh, as we go forward later in the presentation. So in addition to the clearinghouse, uh, the terminology services community also defines and manages the uh, terminology services component uh, of the overall architecture. And this is a, uh, a runtime or deployment component that is part of the OpenHIE architecture uh, that provides a, a central resource again, but this is a local resource uh, within the uh, within the HIE, within the health exchange, um, for these definitional assets, these things that we've been talking about, the terminologies and dictionaries, code systems, value sets, uh, that can be used by the various other components. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what those are, why they are, uh, why we feel that's important, uh, and then talk about some of the interfaces uh, that we make available uh, so that this information can be shared um, among the various other components in the exchange. So why do we want standard terminologies? Um, we talk a little bit about this, but well, it's obvious that one needs them, but I, I think it's worth maybe just spending a minute or so upon understanding why we really want to use these. And, and it's not a complicated discussion, uh, but it's essentially that we need to be able to normalize or compare the various instances of clinical data that we have, the diagnoses, the procedures, the medications. Um, we need to have a common way to represent those. Uh, and, and the principal reason for doing that is so that we can count them. Um, we don't need standard terminology for the providers. Uh, providers understand uh, what all these things mean. But when we introduce computers into these systems, um, we want to be able to count things and report on things in a variety of ways. Uh, so that data has to be normalized. We have to have a standard way of representing um, what is an HIV uh, medication, uh, what is a diagnosis of diabetes, uh, what kind of a procedure has been performed, uh, so that we can count those things in a consistent way and in a reproducible way over time. So we know what happens last year, what's going to happen next year, and what's happening this year. In addition to counting things, then, um, we also have to be able to aggregate and report. Um, there are lots of different types of diabetes that we may want to report on, a lot of different types of HIV medications. Uh, sometimes we want the individual medication. Sometimes we just want to know the group of those. What is the group of those medi medications, and how do we report that? Uh, and so that's grouping. Uh, so really, that's the reason we, we spend all this time talking about standard terminologies, um, not because we think they're really wonderful things and we like to spend a lot of time, but we need to be able to count and we need to be able to group things. We have to do that in a consistent way across time and across various points of service. Being able to do that is why standard terminologies and why a terminology service um, is a part of the open HIE architecture. Then to go into a little bit of, of kind of what does that mean today? What are the issues um, that we look at as we bring one of these implementations forward? Um, as I'm sure most of you are aware, um, the, the environment that, that we all work in requires access to a large number of standard terminologies. There isn't a, a single international standard that kind of solves all of our problems. Um, there are lots of standards. Uh, there's certainly a lot of standards in the United States, and I know there are many standards that are used in, in your countries. Uh, so we, it's just a reality. We have to be able to deal with the fact um, that, that there are multiple types of assets. And as we get further into the presentation, we'll look at some examples of those. Um, but there's really a lot of those out there that, with which we have to deal. 
And secondly, these aren't static. I referred to static as, as being relatively static, but they do change. Um, they're under constant revision. Uh, new diseases are found. New types of procedures are invented. New medications are created. Uh, things change. Things are retired. Uh, so most all of these terminologies we find uh, are updated at least once a year. Uh, some are updated more frequently than that, quarterly, monthly, and medications obviously can even be updated on a weekly or daily basis. Um, so we have to be able to deal with the fact uh, that these terminologies are under constant revision and how do we handle that? How do we deal with uh, version management and version control, if you will, uh, within our systems? So then going back to the terminology services component, um, really the, the major reason for the existence for the, of that component is to maintain the official version of the data sets that are used in implementation. And we can call this the gold standard or the single source of truth. There's, there's all kinds of phrases that are used. Um, but the idea is uh, that there is a single location where any component, when any application in an information network um, can know, well, this is the right version of a given diagnosis value set, for example, that, that I want to use, that we are using. And again, the focus being on, on getting that reproducibility, that normalization of the data, uh, so that we can do counting and grouping. What often happens uh, in the initial stages of, of the development of an architecture or, or of an implementation is that every component says, well, you know, I know we're using this little bit of ICD or I know we're using this little bit of, uh, of SNOMED uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep that in, in my component and I'm going to work with it. Uh, as you can imagine, what, what results is you have multiple duplicate copies of these data sets uh, all over the health information network. Everyone thinks they have the right version um, and it, it very rapidly uh, becomes a case where the data is no longer comparable uh, and uh, a Ministry of Health, for example, no longer has control over the types of data that are being represented and the ways in which they are represented. So again, a terminology service is that central component by which any of the other components can really find out what is the official version and how do we get that version. And we'll talk about the, the mechanisms for that uh, in a moment. In addition, a terminology service can, can provide some advanced functions. These aren't always used in, in every um, information exchange, um, but mapping between code systems, uh, a difficult, uh, issue uh, about doing mappings, but often uh, very much required, certainly, um, as we talk about the difference between a local terminology and a reporting standard like ICD, there may be requirements for mapping there. And then the whole idea of concept membership and subsumption, again, grouping, um, how do we group certain diagnoses uh, for reporting? How do we do that for aggregation? Uh, and those are some of the advanced functions that, that a terminology service can support. So we have this resource uh, and it exists locally again within your network, uh, but how do the various components access it? What do they do with it? Um, now, three or four years ago when, when we were uh, defining uh, the OpenHAE architecture and looking at the various components, there really weren't very many ways of, of getting a standard uh, interface, a standard mechanism for exchanging this kind of data. Uh, and unfortunately, we were, we were kind of stuck with idiosyncratic and, and proprietary interfaces that were available at that time. Uh, obviously, these are hard to use and they're certainly not portable uh, between any different implementations, between different country implementations. Uh, it made it very difficult to kind of integrate that architecture uh, together easily. Over the last couple of years, however, um, terminology services and in fact most of the components uh, that are part of the OpenHAE architecture uh, have been moving to standard interfaces uh, that have been drawn from the HL7 fire specifications. So 
Um, FIRE uh, is, a, is a very active uh, and comprehensive community right now um, addressing these issues of how do different components interact with one another, how is that data exchanged, and how it can be an exchanged in a, in a standard way. Uh, so we are moving very strongly uh, within terminology services and in the other components to a FIRE-based uh, interface mechanism. And if you look at FIRE uh, and the various resources that, that FIRE defines, the three that are of most importance to terminology services are code systems, value sets, and concept maps. So these are the names of those resources, uh, and those are the resources that we support within the terminology service interface. Now, FIRE can be complex. Um, it is large and, and continues to, to get larger as time goes forward. Uh, so what we have to do is then say, well, okay, within the FIRE specification, what are the key operations that we want to be able to support? And looking at the standard uh, transactions, and again, we're not talking so much about terminology management right now, but we're talking about terminology deployment. How do we get terminology and terminological data uh, into the hands of the various components of an information architecture? Uh, and it turns out that there's, there's really only about a handful of operations that are really necessary. Uh, and we've tried to identify these, and these are the ones that are part of the use cases that we develop uh, within OpenHIE. So the first of those is very simply just existence. Does a given code exist within a code system or a value set of interest? Uh, oftentimes, um, a clinical data repository will receive information from a lot of different sources, uh, from a lot of different point of care systems. Uh, and when that data comes in, again, it needs to be normalized. We need to be able to represent it in a standard way. And if that diagnosis comes in with a certain code, we have to say, hey, is this a code we recognize? Is this a code within the code system or the value set um, that we define as the standard data set for our information network? So answering the question of existence uh, is one of the key operations and one that is, that is uh, directly supported uh, by FIRE. Now, after we've determined that this information that we've accepted from a point of care system um, has been appropriately encoded that we have it, uh, now if we want to do some reporting, we may want to, we have to, usually have to understand about membership of that. Uh, well, I have to report on HIV diagnoses. Is that diagnosis a member of the HIV value set uh, that I defined? So grouping, again, going back to the idea of counting and grouping, we need to be able to understand whether a given code is a member of a value set. Uh, does it exist within that set? So membership, again, a uh, basic fire operation that's been defined for a long time uh, and one that we find very useful in our operations. Uh, the next operation that we'll talk about is expansion. Um, get the codes in the HIV value set. Now this becomes very interesting because I, I spoke earlier about how we didn't want all of the various applications in our network uh, to have their own you know, version of, of, of ICD or their own version of a value set and everybody's kind of doing their own thing. But that doesn't mean that those applications cannot locally hold instances of that value set. Obviously, for, for performance reasons, if you're doing a lot of analysis, if you're doing a, a, a very comprehensive longitudinal report, you don't want to go and hit the, the terminology service every time to see, well, is this a member of HIV? Is this new code a member of HIC? That has certainly performance implications uh, for the network as a whole. So it's very appropriate for certain types of applications that they hold that HAV value set, that they know what all those values are, and then they can do their operations very effectively and much more efficiently uh, in kind of a local mode. But the difference here is at some point, maybe it's once a day, maybe it's once a week, maybe it's once every reporting period, they access that central terminology service to get the codes that are in that HAV value set. 
Uh, they don't go off to their friend. They don't go off to some other application to get it. They go to the terminology service to, again, get the gold standard definition of that value set that's been defined by the Ministry of Health, defined by the governance structure of the health information network. So caching some of these assets is a perfectly valid way um, and a very good way to, to implement terminology services within a network. But that caching always has to be backed by the codes that are in the standard terminology service. So you have access control. Uh, and we're really all getting the same version of these codes. We have comparability. Um, we can make the reports the way we want. I talked a little bit uh, earlier about mapping uh, somewhat contentious subject sometimes. Uh, but there are needs for mapping on, and the fire operations support. Uh, the ability to uh, get mappings between various terminology sets, between value sets, uh, in order to facilitate reporting in certain ways. Uh, so mapping is the fourth of the standard operations that we define uh, as part of the terminology services interface. Uh, FHIR supports a whole lot of other types of operations which can be useful in these environments, but these are really the four and that we rely on for the definitions of our use cases uh, and that are uh, supported within the, the reference implementation. Just a, a quick note on, on reference implementations. The, uh, the standard reference implementation for uh, OpenHIE is a uh, product called Apple on DTS, uh, Distributed Terminology System. This is an open source terminology server. Um, that is uh, provided by, uh, by Apollon, uh, and it is part of this standard implementation. Uh, uh, the application's been around for over 15, nearly 20 years right now, used in a variety of uh, types of organizations, both public and private sector organizations around the world, and it's a fairly robust system, and it certainly includes a lot of terminology management, terminology definition, terminology governance, creation activities. Uh, but for the purposes of OpenHIE, it's a server that implements those FHIR, the standard FHIR interfaces uh, within on implementation. Um, you can get further information on that uh, there, and uh, Applin does uh, provide support and content support and terminology consulting services uh, for terminologies. And that's the reference implementation that we have available. Okay, so let's finish up by talking a little bit about terminology services adoption. Um, what are the considerations? What are some of the issues that we see? Uh, and how are people using terminologies today? I think it's really important that that we all understand this is this is not a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. It's not like, well, here's a standard terminology service, and we're going to plop this in in each of our implementations. Um, we find that that every implementation varies greatly in their adoption of a terminology services approach, their adoption of of various tools. Uh, and in their adoption of the various specific terminologies that are used. Um, this has to be driven by the specific use case. It may be maternal health, it may be HIV, it may be immunization tracking. Um, as these systems come online, they have specific use cases. And it's really important to view the utilization of terminology services and the utilization of terminologies in the context of those use cases. Uh, there isn't a, a one standard way to do this. Uh, obviously, national organizations vary greatly in their maturity for terminology governance. Uh, do you want to get in the business of creating your own terminology? Is it better if you use a standard terminology? Do you want to use what parts of a standard terminology do you want to use? Um, how do you want to make these terminologies available to your stakeholders? <laughs> Excuse me. Those are the kinds of questions that um, any national organization has to be able to think about and answer in order to be able to deploy this. We also find that use cases often are really required to specify uh, certain terminologies. Uh, 
if, if your use case for immunization tracking uh, requires reporting to WHO, for example, WHO may already say, well, you have to encode this data. You have to report this data using a certain code system. Uh, so sometimes you have options to do things locally. Sometimes you're really required by external forces, um, external organizations, uh, to utilize certain terminologies. Uh, you can still locally use your local terminology and then map those to those standard terminologies for reporting. A lot of organizations do that. Um, other organizations decide, well, I really don't want to have to go through that mapping process. Um, it's a constant governance requirement. Uh, it can take a lot of resources. Maybe it's easier if you just start with that standard terminology uh, to begin with. Those are the kinds of questions that have to go along with governance. Now, one of the things that we've seen uh, in working with various country organizations um, is what we're going to call, I'll call a terminology governance maturity model. This is, a, this is an idea that we've gotten uh, in talking to a lot of implementers uh, and trying to understand, well, how do we position terminology services? How are terminology services, and in fact, um, the metadata clearinghouse that I described earlier, how are they best used within a country organization? Uh, so this is certainly a work in progress and, and we'd love to have uh, any uh, comments that you would have, but it's just a kind of a way of looking at how an organization may want to view uh, their maturity and how they would like to go forward and take this uh, maturity going forward. Uh, so kind of at the at the beginning level, at the lowest level, um, an organization may not have currently any centrally defined content or governance. They, they really haven't been collecting information. Um, a Ministry of Health may not have a mechanism uh, by which to do that, and so they're looking to how they can move that forward. Uh, now in the in the emerging stage, uh, there's some content uh, that has been developed. It, it may be very local, it may be very non-standard. Uh, it exists in, in Word documents or, or PDF format. Uh, and there's, there's a beginning look at that, uh, but it, it's still very, uh, very emerging. As organizations move forward then from that, they see the value in uh, really putting a, a real governance structure in place, um, having up-to-date excuse me, up-to-date definitions um, that are aligned with, with the use cases, that are aligned with the users, uh, and they make these available in some type of shared electronic reference. There can be lots of ways of doing this. Again, it, it can be even just that PDF that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but there is a, a, a focus within the organization for the governance of these kinds of assets. As digital adoption becomes more widespread, um, now we have ways of the different applications, the various components, accessing these electronically using programmatic methodologies uh, by which applications can get access to those value sets, get access to those code systems. Uh, and a focus now on really being up to date and harmonizing these standards again, map, using mappings where they may be appropriate, uh, but much a much more up to date process uh, and a process that that really understands how we handle revisions of the terminology. What happens when ICD-10 changes? What happens when we go to ICD-11? Beginning to look at some of those issues, and um, then finally, this whole terminology idea. Uh, becomes institutionalized, and this is often where the terminology service uh, now becomes a, a much more uh, key component. Um, applications are accessing that terminology service programmatically on a regular basis as part of the day-to-day -day operations um, and using validation and expansions and all the things that we talked about earlier uh, to aid in the accuracy uh, and the immediacy of the data that goes on. So this is kind of our first pass at a, at a governance maturity model. And again, I'd love to get your feedback on, on uh, you know, do we have the right steps? Uh, is there another step? Have we missed a few steps on how this goes forward? But I think it might be interesting just to quickly say, well, where do the 
open HIE terminology services community assets fit into this maturity model. <clears throat> and I think once one has reached the, the shared electronic reference model, and perhaps even a little bit earlier, and this is something we're talking about, uh, the clearinghouse can be a way for uh, an institution to make some of these assets available, um, to take advantage of the open HIE infrastructure, uh, to have a place to, to publish these, uh, to distribute them to their stakeholders, uh, and have that, that immediacy and the, the standardization um, as we go forward. The terminology service component really only comes into play as we get into the uh, under the right hand side of the, the diagram here, uh, much more into digital adoption, runtime adoption, and institutionalization of uh, code systems and value sets uh, and mappings. Then we see the terminology service becomes very important uh, to maintain that, that gold standard, to maintain that central repository, and then all of the other applications can take advantage of that uh, and use them. Uh, so a little bit more of an advanced concept, but one that for, for many implementations uh, can be exceedingly valuable. And it all comes down to this idea of governance. Um, how do we control, or not so much control, but define um, how code systems uh, encapsulation of clinical information uh, can be best used. So what I'd like to do is, is just finish up with a, a little slide. This has been under development for the last uh, oh, six months or so. Uh, and uh, again, all, all errors are mine. We try to collect the, the data um, as consistently as we can, but I'm, I'm sure there are some errors in this as we go forward. Um, but just kind of want to show you some of the breadth of, of open HIE implementations or just HIN implementations. Um, that we see around the world, and the, the standards that are being used within various domains. So we have diagnoses, procedures, uh, laboratory tests, medications, devices, and, and billing. Um, a couple of, of clarifying, clarifying points here. Um, everything on this slide obviously is in development. Uh, things are being changed. I know some countries have said, well, we're kind of using ICD-9 now, but we're going to ICD-10. It represented that as ICD-10 on, on the slide just, just for simplicity purposes. Um, the code systems here are obviously the ones that are applicable to the use cases. Um, you know, this isn't to say that, that any of these terminologies couldn't be valuable in these countries, but within their current implementations, within their current use cases, these are the terminologies that they find most important. Uh, and then finally, uh, and perhaps most importantly then, uh, uh, the labels on this slide should be interpreted as national subsets. I mean, no one is using all of SNOMED for their diagnoses. All, no one is using all of LOINC for their lab tests. Uh, they're selecting subsets or value sets of these terminologies that are most applicable to their countries, most applicable to their use cases, uh, and implementing those within their environments. Um, so we really shouldn't look at this as we want to use all of SNOMED or we want to use all of, of UMDNS or CVX, but rather we want to draw from those standard terminologies um, the subsets that are most applicable uh, to the information we want to collect. Um, now, just a, a quick look at this as well, you know, most people kind of like ICD-10 for diagnoses, and that's not surprising because of reporting requirements, um, but it does offer to a large extent uh, a reasonable granularity uh, of being able to represent that. Uh, laboratories, LOINC has really good representation. LOINC is, a, is, if you will, the single international uh, mechanism by which laboratory tests and, and results uh, are encoded. Beyond diagnoses and laboratories, things get a little spotty. Um, procedures tend to be very difficult, especially looking for a, a public um, or open domain representation. Uh, really hard to find something. Uh, CPT, CCHI, uh, again, are, are kind of local to uh, individual country. Uh, 
or individual company uh, representations, um, are they the best ones to use? I think we're still kind of struggling with how best to represent procedures. Um, medications inherently are local and medication formularies are, are in general defined by the individual country. So I wouldn't expect to see um, a lot of standardization there. But within certain use cases, immunizations for example, um, a standard like CBX can be of a lot of help and, and be very valuable. So again, very dependent on the use cases uh, that are being done. Um, devices, quite difficult. Uh, UMDNS has some representation around the world, but a lot of differences. And then we're just beginning to get into some billing issues, and I think that's really a, a tentative line uh, on my slide uh, that, that people are still trying to figure out what the best way and, and how best to represent that in a, in a standard mechanism uh, for terminology services. Um, so with that, what I'd like to do is, is kind of bring the, the formal part of the uh, presentation to an end, um, try to describe a little bit about how uh, OpenHIE looks at terminology services, some of the ways that uh, terminology information, metadata information can be made avail available, uh, and some of the mechanisms that we use to, in fact, work with organizations to do that. So with that, um, let me kind of turn things over and see if there are any questions and how we want to do this. Thank you. Hello. Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Jack. Uh, we would like to encourage our participants to send in your questions now. Uh, so to get started, here's the first question from Dr. Alvin Marcelo. Uh, it reads, how can we implement a TS for Asia? And if we get enough interested participants from different countries, what other things do we need? Um, very interesting question. And, and I think the one question that I would put back is, um, given the, the descriptions that I've gone through, uh, here, I, I really want to make a, a distinction between that, the kind of clearinghouse activity <coughs> by which there is a central repository of primary assets uh, that can be used, say, across Asia, versus uh, truly a runtime terminology services activity um, which provides uh, procedural uh, and really interface capabilities to, to some of the lower level functions um, that we talked about before. Uh, do you see a, and, and in fact this can be tiered, which is which is very interesting uh, activity. We've seen this in, in some implementations whereby, uh, let's say Asia would have a central clearinghouse uh, for this is the version of ICD-10. Um, this is the, the version of a procedural terminology uh, that is going to be used. And then each country organization would have more of, of a terminology service component, uh, but that terminology service component would draw from the central clearinghouse. So again, once a year, once a month, whatever. Um, the terminology service would draw from the clearinghouse that procedural terminology uh, and then provide uh, the kind of operational uh, procedural activities of a terminology service for the purpose of the country. Uh, and then those could again be subset again uh, for individual uh, subsets of the Asian terminology for use within a given country. Um, lots of governance issues, I think, that, that would be involved. But architecturally, um, that I think would be a, an interesting, uh, an, an interesting mechanism uh, that that could be used. As I say, we, we've seen some of this within the United States, some of this within Canada. Um, you know, where there are kind of national repositories, and then those come down to uh, more regional repositories and terminology services that, that really operate on a local regional basis for performance and, and connectivity kinds of reasons. 
Um, Alvin, does that help a lot at all? I guess we'll hear from Dr. Alvin in a while. Uh, he has another question, Dr. Jack. Uh, if, we, if different hospitals have their own terminology service, is it possible to connect these to a national terminology service? Uh, absolutely, and and again, I think that that gets back to uh, you know my previous answer. Uh, now we haven't defined what the individual transactions are, if you will, uh, between this multi-tier environment. Um, but there are examples of those um, uh, that that are out there in the world, and I think uh, having that type of synchronization activity between various assets can be very powerful and can be very useful. Um, within the United States, uh, the Veterans Administration, uh, it's a very large uh, system of, of hospitals and, and provider organizations for use by our veterans, uh, takes a, a regional and, and tiered approach to, to some of these assets so that there's a, a central repository uh, there's local repositories, and they draw from the central repositories, but provide um, local operational support uh, at an individual basis, say, say at a hospital or, or a large health system basis. So um, I think that it would be a, a really interesting and, and effective mechanism uh, requires a little bit of, of design and, and definition of those, um, of those transactions, but I think it could be that could be done quite well. Yes, thank you, Dr. Jack. Uh, Dr. Alvin says, um, primary asset will be medicine code sets, and the reason for a transaction is claims reimbursement. I'm sorry, I was I was staring at the questions, and I don't think we're on the same one. <laughs> so, um, what? Uh, which... uh, sorry, uh, it's in the lower part. The message from Dr. Alvin. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Can um, I, my line had a drop out and I didn't I didn't catch all that. I guess all right. Uh, I I think um, the uh, the first message from Dr. Alvin is the primary asset will be medicine code set. And then uh, the reason for a transaction uh, is claims reimbursement. Okay. Um, I don't know whether that's a, a question or a, or a, or a statement. Um, Follow up. Did you follow up in the questions earlier? Yeah, uh, maybe. Uh, why don't we Why don't we go back and uh, let me try to pick up on um, some of the earlier questions. All right. Uh, we have another question, Dr. Jack. It's from Dr. Elaine Baker. So, uh, how does Open HIE terminology service? relate to CIEL Concept Dictionary and Open Concept Lab? Um, really good question. Uh, if we look at the, the metadata clearinghouse activity the, that we're involved in right now, um, that clearinghouse is based on uh, an initial OCL code base. Um, that we have or are in the process of uh, extending um, and implementing uh, for the purposes of the, the clearinghouse. Uh, so the, the underlying components, and I think that was on one of those slides. If I go back just a little bit, uh, let's see, I don't want to misrepresent that. I'll go back to OCL here. Uh, right, that the um, the clearinghouse. If we look down here on the bottom of of this slide, um, the underlying software for the clearinghouse is is the OCL software uh, 
uh, and OpenHIM, open source software. So we we added some things, uh, you know, added versioning, made it a little bit more robust uh, to be able to to make that available on the on the clearinghouse. Um, in fact, as we as we look going forward, it may be that one of the things that we want to provide within the clearinghouse uh, is an instance of the the seal concept dictionary. Uh, we mentioned that we want to take the, the clearinghouse going forward uh, and being able to make starter sets, other kinds of uh, of metadata uh, for indications, et cetera, available and uh, putting the the seal concept definitions uh, up on the clearinghouse is certainly something that um, that we're looking at. Uh, and again, a lot of this will be, you know, dependent on and fed by what our uh, what our users and our stakeholders are, are looking at getting. Uh, but that's certainly possible, and a, a lot of that technology is the same. Um, those tend to be, at least today, more management and distribution mechanisms rather than uh, terminology development mechanisms. Um, the uh, DTS reference implementation uh, has a lot more in the way of development resources, um, but you know I think even longer term, uh, as we look forward with Open HIE, we'd we'd like to kind of see how we can blend these more a little bit together, so that we might be able to provide a, a community development mechanism uh, for terminology services um, that that gets more into the whole governance activity. Uh, the management of terminologies and the governments of terminologies, as opposed to pure distribution, which is what the clearinghouse is, and kind of pure runtime deployment, which is what the reference implementation is. Um, no real hard answers on that, just uh, something that we're, we're looking at and we hope we can be able to bring forward. There's a question about is the terminology service only available for health information exchange? Um, not sure um, exactly what that what that question is trying to get at. Um, uh, the terminology service is a is a general service uh, that is provided with regard to these information exchanges. I mean, there's been there's been various discussions about, well, is it only medical assets? Can it be organizational assets? What other kinds of, of data sets? And I think that's a design decision um, that uh, individual um, architecture, architectures will, will come up. So I'm not sure that I'm answering that question in the right way, um, but I think we're, we're trying to develop uh, components that are of general applicability for a, for a wide variety of environments and, and we just kind of have to see how those go forward. Uh, yes, Dr. Jack, thank you. Uh, we now have with us Dr. Raymond Sarmento. Uh, Dr. Raymond, can you turn on your microphone? I'm sorry, still having a little bit of hearing. What What was the... Uh, we have Dr. Raymond Sarmento with us uh, there. Yes. Uh, hello, Dr. Raymond. Hello. Um, thank you for the presentation, Jack. I'm Raymond Sarmiento. Um, I'm the uh, TS lead for the Standards and Interoperability Lab for Asia. Um, it was a great presentation. My question uh, delves into more more about the deployment and maintenance, uh, which uh, often impacts uh, platform selection. Um, in terms of uh, those two areas, um, how would you compare Apelon DTS to OCL for deployment and maintenance versus the um, Fire TS that runs on the Happy framework? Over. Oh, okay. Um, well, again, I, I would I would make a distinction between. Um, the, the kind of terminology distribution um, role that that OCL plays um, with 
with a, a kind of fire-based runtime uh, services uh, activity. I mean, they're really designed for different purposes um, and, and designed to be used in different ways. Uh, and they're very complementary to that extent. Uh, so, you know, we, we're using um, an OCL-based uh, system for the, the metadata clearinghouse here. Um, just because it was the, the nicest way to, to get that put together. Um, certainly, uh, DTS or other types of terminology systems are, are also capable of, of supporting that, but meant to be used in more of a um, operational uh, methodology. Uh, and in the case of DTS, a uh, kind of fine-grained terminology development and management. So if you, you know, defining new concepts of finding whole code systems, uh, defining value sets, all those kinds of things, I think you'll find are a little bit more uh, completely implemented today, at least, uh, within DTS than, than within an OCL uh, type environment. Um, purely for terminology deployment services, I mean, the idea is that any system that implements fire can implement fire. And, and so we want to use standard implementations. Uh, so any fire implementation would be able to provide the kinds of uh, capabilities uh, that, uh, that you need for existence, uh, you know, value set groupings, uh, expansion, mapping, the, the things that we talked about earlier as the, uh, the basic things. Uh, what then becomes more important then is, well, how do you get those terminologies? How do you get those value sets? Uh, how do you get those subsets? How are they represented? Um, FIRE provides pretty good access capabilities, but not really any management or development capabilities. So uh, even to use the happy uh, implementation of FIRE, you still need to find a way to, to get the terminologies into that system, uh, to manage them if you want, um, to uh, develop those, have governance structures around those, have versioning around those. Um, how does all that work? Um, again, I'm not familiar exactly with how um, Happy System handles versioning. Versioning is a little odd within FIRE. Um, you can do it, but the question of how that's really implemented on the back-end systems uh, becomes uh, a little more problematic, I think. But, but again, I haven't looked at Happy recently, so that may, that may have changed. Uh, so I think there's really a, a continuum of capabilities that we look at. Uh, and the question for any implementer is to say, well, what do I need to do? Where am I within that maturity model? Uh, what are the capabilities that need to be provided? Uh, and then really do a comparison with the various implementations to see which ones uh, meet those requirements or maybe multiple meet them. As I say, some kind of a tiered approach um, could be very effective uh, for some of these uh, more complex environments that I think Ahian is looking at. Uh, thank you, Jack. So uh, I was just with uh, Graham Grieve, and I'm now with uh, James Agnew. Um, I, I recently learned that the Fire TS does not uh, is not able to handle versioning. So that that's something that uh, happy. Uh, happy is that isn't able to handle versioning. So that's something that uh, uh, we we might need to look into. Um, I'm also with uh, Donna Medeiros. She says hi, <laughs> and uh, with. Uh, I would like to thank you for being able to uh, give us a clear um, understanding of uh, terminology services. Uh, we hope we could invite you for future webinars on the TS in the future. Well, thank you. I very much, very much enjoyed this. Um, I, I would just mention that um, the DTS implementation of FIRE does support uh, a limited set of versioning. So again, depending upon what you're looking at, and FIRE does provide business versions, which can be defined, um, which if supported by the backend processors, will be able to uh, feedback version information. Um, again, maybe something for you to look at as, um, as we go forward. But uh, I know we're coming to the top of the hour, and I don't want to take up any more of your time, but I really appreciate um, the opportunity to talk to you folks and um, 
answer at least some of the questions you had. I don't think we get all, but, but uh, obviously feel free to get back to me with any other questions and happy to, um, to get together again at your convenience. Thank you, Dr. Jack, and to all our participants who attended this webinar. Uh, we look forward to having a meeting like this again. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.